an unannounced trip from Texas to New York becomes incredibly strange for a man named Gary Subring. Strange questions from strange men and a series of phone calls from an unknown entity make Gary question his own reality. You're listening to the Mysterious Bruise Podcast, and tonight we bring you the case of You're Being Impersonated by the Other Voice. Welcome to a deep, dark, semi-moist, kind of like three-quarter chubbed basement. (laughs) (laughs) Jesus. Everybody's kicking the tires and lighting the fires when it's school time. In Georgia, we have started back amongst the COVID pandemic. We will not get into that, but we will just say that it's different. Yeah, it's weird, man. Um I don't know how long it'll last, but yeah, we're back working. Yep, and we, uh, I kind of hinted to our Patreon members, uh, I am in the middle of changing jobs, so that early access that you get is roughly about six or eight hours the last two weeks. I promise I'm going to do better about getting it edited and getting it out to you at least 24 hours in advance. Mm-hmm. No, I really ain't. Likely story. Uh, also on the t-shirt front, by the time this episode drops, we will have closed the pre-sale on our t-shirts. So hopefully all of you that have ordered them will have received yours or will have at least a shipping date to let you know when they're coming. More importantly, the beer is... Brooklyn Brewery, because we are revisiting. Hopefully by now you've listened to our best of and worst of episode, and you'll know that my favorite episode is uh, episode three about a man named Gary Subrink. And tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to report that we're actually going to interview the man and talk about his incident and hopefully it'll be very entertaining i know it's going to be entertaining for me so that's all that really matters to revisit that we got brooklyn brewery we got east ipa it is very very tasty i believe when we did it the first time we did uh just brooklyn lager i'm not exactly sure i can't remember back that far it was over a year ago there was a lot of beer involved between then and now but you know we were just we we were sitting around and saying that we would like to interview somebody and we almost had a pretty big interview locked up, but it kind of fell through for for another, now. Another case, yeah, it fell through for now. But we were really looking forward to that if that would have happened. But on a whim, on a whim, man, I just thought of Gary Subrink. Said, "Let's try to get him." And I remembered from the case when we we saw on Reddit that somebody had listed his YouTube page, and I went to his YouTube page and just put a comment on one of his videos. Said, "Hey, man, is this the?" The Gary Subrick that got all the weird phone calls? And he was like, yes. I said, you know, uh, be interested in an interview. And surprisingly, he, he said, yeah. So He agreed. Yeah. We were as shocked as you are. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. So, yeah, I mean, I couldn't be happier. Hopefully you'll get some of your questions answered. Not asked, but answered. Hopefully we clear up a little bit of some of the mystery around part of this case. Listener feedback, and we love feedback. Um, Mr. Jacob Luttrell from Huntsville, Arkansas said that he would really like it if we would put a vote page on which of our two theories at the end of each episode that listeners like. That's a good idea. And that is a great idea. That's a real good idea. And I think we're going to have to do it. I think so. But again, thank you, Jacob, for uh, the feedback. We appreciate everybody that listens to us in Arkansas. Hopefully, we've not made too many enemies out there. So without further ado, we bring you the interview with Mr. Gary Sudbrink. Thank you very much for being with us, man. It's, it's great. Sure, no problem. It's, uh, your case fascinates the hell out of me. So... That's good. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of weird, uh, weird case. Yeah. All right, we're here with Gary Subrink, and uh, am I saying that right, Gary Sudbrink? 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Awesome. I don't want to be getting anything wrong. Um, how are you doing tonight, sir? I'm doing pretty good. Right. I just got off of work, so. Yeah. Right. For those of you who may not know, uh, we covered Gary's case on episode three. It, if you happen to tune in and listen to our top five favorite episodes, you'll know that this was actually my favorite episode of all time, my favorite case. So we are very honored to have him. And Gary, did you listen to our, to our episode? Uh, yeah, I did, yeah. What did you think of it? I was okay. I mean, the only part was about that, um, it was, uh, what was that box you were talking about? The, the talk boy, the th- talk boy theory? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was, you know, what's kind of stupid about it is, is it doesn't take into consideration everything surrounding that event. You know? you, yeah, you're absolutely right about that. But again, I mean, like. You can't just isolate that one thing, you know. Yes, sir. Yeah, I wholeheartedly. And I'm a true believer in this case. I didn't even want to talk about the fact that it could be hoax, but you know, we had yeah. we had well, to at least put a counterpoint to... on there. You know. Yeah, just just um, I just figured I had to mention that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know what's odd is that um, you know after the Mothman movie came out, mm-hmm. or just before I think it was. Um, you know, they republished John Keel's book. Oh, really? The Mothman Prophecies, yeah. It was just uh, either before or after, right around the time that movie came out. Uh-huh. So when I was reading that, I was really shocked to find out the same exact thing happened to John Keel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, with Andrew Cole, I, I believe the, the entity's yeah. name was. What happened is he called one of his uh, co-workers, I forget, um, one of the guys he worked with, I forget his name, uh, Jim Mosley. So he calls Mosley, and, and Mosley says to him, you know, I don't remember the exact quotes from the book, but um, he said, you called earlier, you sounded like you were drunk, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, if that didn't happen, Keel would have never known that somebody was impersonating him. Yes, yeah, sir. So something like that is done on purpose. Otherwise, you would never bring it up and you would never know. Mm-hmm. Now, all this stuff is engineered that way. Yeah, when uh, when you talked to Mike and he said that somebody that you had called earlier, I mean, did what? How did that conversation sound? Well, I mean, what was said? Um, well, he just said that he goes, he said something like, uh, you, you know, you sound better because you sounded like you had a cold yesterday, mm-hmm. something to that effect. And that's when I I know something was up, you know, because I didn't call him yesterday, and and that's and within, you know, that was. Um, because I landed at the airport the previous day, uh-huh. and then when I spoke to him was the next day. So here it is. The minute I'm finding this out, that's when the phone call came in confirming that that somebody, you know, they they said that you're being impersonated by the other voice. So uh-huh. It's not like they said person or anything. It's kind of weird. Yeah, this the, the, the wording, wording of it's just so strange. Yeah. So the timing would require a phone tap. I mean, there's no way. That within seconds of me finding out, that's, uh-huh. a call is going to come in confirming it. Yeah, so, so you were you were actually on the other line with Mike when the call came in. Yeah, a call waiting. I heard the call waiting. Okay, that's uh-huh. even odd. And I had um, a caller ID, but when when it doesn't pick up anything, it just says out of area. Yes, sir. That's like a generic, um, uh, you know, when, when there's no information, mm-hmm. I guess. And so, you, and you just, just instinctively hit record on the answer machine. Just yeah, I went to the answering machine to hit record. Uh huh. So luckily, I mean, and thank God you did. I mean, today, yeah, because today I don't even know. It even has an answering machine. As far yeah, as I know. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> your cell phone. Yeah. I certainly don't. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's you know that's kind of gone to the wayside now. Everybody's got a cell phone. Mm hmm. Okay, so and. So, you were in Texas, and you were you got uh you got a you were put on leave, correct? And you were going to visit your family, and a man. Yeah, so what? Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Actually, oh, before this happened, um, there was an incident where this there was a, I was in my apartment, and I and I heard a helicopter. It was really loud. You know, with the propellers. Yes, sir. The rotors and all that. Uh huh. So I look out the sliding door. And I see this helicopter 
outside the perimeter fence, wooden perimeter fence of the apartment complex. Because mm-hmm. right outside that is just a dirt field, you know, undeveloped. So I'm looking at it and I see this helicopter like 20 feet off the ground, just hovering there. Oh, wow. So I had to get my glasses to get a better look. And, you know, by the time I got my glasses, the thing was gone. So Holy moly. So I'm looking out, you know, the sliding door, and, and, and I'm thinking, because, you know, when, when I went back, there's a guy watching his, cleaning his car, doing something. So I was going to ask him, did you see that? But it just seemed so ridiculous, because it was so obvious. How, I didn't ever ask him, you know? So, yeah. Wow. Um, so, yeah, so later, when I was taking, I didn't take, actually, I had like a three-day weekend, and a lot of people are not going to take vacation days. When they already have off, you know? Yes, sir. You waste them. You waste them. So, uh, you know, it's kind of funny. Uh, I, I met some people, someone else, that, and she's like, don't tell anybody, because technically, if, if you're going far away, uh, you have to take leave, like if you're leaving town pretty far. Yes, sir. Okay. So, so. I that's all I could say. Right there. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so I have to... <laughs> you know... Uh, and yeah, so I had a sweater on. I had my Air Force uniform on, but and it, but a sweater was covering my the name tag under my shirt. Mm-hmm. So as I'm waiting in the uh, in the area at the uh, what do you call it um, the gate? Yeah, as I'm waiting at the gate, this guy he's got like brown hair with an overcoat, and he comes over and he just starts just normal conversation, you know, nothing unusual, just general, how you doing, what that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So as they're calling Rose out, he wants, he's got a little pad, you know, like those, those little notepads. And he wants, he wants to write my name down. It's just freaking weird, you know? Mm-hmm. So I didn't, I didn't, it just seems kind of strange. I don't want to tell him, so. I mean, I'm thinking like, why? You know? So anyway, so I get on the plane and, uh, well, yeah, he said, he, yeah, also he says, uh, don't worry, you won't get in trouble. What? You know, and I'm, that's kind of weird to say too, right? Because I didn't want to give him my name, and then he said that. So uh-huh. I don't know. It's just weird. Anyway, so, so if so you I get on the plane, if your name tag was covered, yeah. I mean, so how do you how do you think that they knew that it was you? I mean, just well, he didn't he didn't know what my name was. That's why he asked me. Oh, I okay. Uh huh. But if I would have had my sweater off, my name would have been visible. So I don't know what would have happened in that case. Yeah. Wow. At least my last name would have. Yeah. Anyway, but uh, so I get on the plane and this guy sits next to me, and he starts just like normal, like if you started a conversation with somebody. And it, it was uh, so. Eventually, yeah, he's sitting right to my right hand side. Eventually, someone comes over and, and says, "I'm you're in my seat." You know, they got the ticket with the seat. No. Mm-hmm. So he moves over to the middle. And as the plane continues to fill up, he's got to leave that seat. And then he goes to his real seat, which is further back, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> but he went into the middle seat because he was still, he was still talking back and forth. And this, this was a different man than the, the, the original guy, correct? Yeah, this guy had blonde hair and glasses. Uh-huh. So before, when he gets knocked out of the second one seat, which is directly to my right in the middle row, behind me is... Um, one of those uh, emergency exit doors mm-hmm. behind my seat. So he's standing up there, and I forget what we were saying, but uh, before the stewardess asked him to sit down, he wants to know my name too. Wow. Hmm. You know? So yeah. I'm thinking, you know, I, I knew something was odd, you know? So, so when I got home, I called the apartment complex and said, you know, I, I figured between the two of them, they knew I lived in San Antonio, and I was going out of town. Mm-hmm. Obviously, I was going on a plane. So I figured, well, maybe they're going to rob my apartment, even though there's nothing to take. But So I just had them look at my apartment and see if anything was missing or messed up, whatever. Okay. Yeah, they didn't see anything. And then... Uh, Yeah, the next day is when uh, the phone call came in. Okay. So did you notice that either one of them were talking to other people, or do you feel like that you were specifically uh, singled no, out? No, not talking to anybody. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, they weren't talking to anybody else. So you basically were targeted. Yeah, I mean, somehow that's connected, and, and this helicopter incident outside the apartment complex is kind of important because it also happened to my father in Long Island when my brother was there. So they both seen this. Another, you know, it's kind of common in this phenomena where these helicopters fly low. Yes, sir. So it ha- that happened um, around, I wasn't there at the time, but it happened at the house in Long Island when my brother was there, and it's, it came extremely low. I would probably say 30 feet from what he described. And not only that, the thing tilted on its side, which helicopters can't do unless, you know, this is what you had discussions with pilots. They can't do that unless they're actually moving and turning, banking. Uh-huh. I mean, the rotors just can't work sideways, you know, and just hover. Yeah. So, yeah, it's kind of weird. Yes. So these helicopter incidents, I don't know, you know. Mm-hmm. All this weirdness is connected together. Yeah, it's, I mean, I would be, I would have been terrified. <laughs> because, but that's just me, because I'm not a very brave person. <laughs> yeah, I was more like, and like um, I was just just in like more like shock and awe, shock awe, what do they call it shock and awe yes sir it's more like that <laughs> but I was experiencing it uh-huh. and then the incident with, like you said with my brother saying he uh, you know during his wedding this is my older brother mm-hmm. and then he I didn't see him and, and that's when he said well, I drove up in, in my car which was in San Antonio. Mm-hmm. You know, I guess Powell went to his car and made faces and then took off. So. But he never told me that until after this phone call incident. Really? You know, at the time it happened, he never said anything. Uh-huh. Probably because, you know, he was having his wedding and all that. Yeah. Just some <laughs> off... Kind of makes sense. <laughs> so, just some off chance he said that you pulled up next to him, made weird faces, and just drove off. Yeah. So I'm thinking, well... Because I had a lot of time to think about this. You know, it says, on the, on the tape it says, show double of you, and I guess that's, I don't know, maybe it has something to do with that. Uh-huh. Couple gangers and stuff. The whole thing is freaking weird. Yeah. Okay. You know, of course, the timing of everything is important. And these people, you know, the, the incident with the helicopter, the people at the airport, I mean, all this ties in together, so it's not like... You can separate that from from the phone calls. Yeah. Uh, well, do you think the uh, the incident that when your brother saw you? Do you think that's connected as well? Yeah, I don't know what else to make of it. Yeah. How was the time frame? So you know, there's a lot, a lot of freakish things that happen. I mean, so what? So my mother was getting treated for cancer in 2001. Mm-hmm. Here's another weird example. They, they go to the doctor's office, and I don't know why they brought this up, but the doctor said your your daughter called and wanted to know about your renal function. And we don't we don't have a, I just have two brothers. I don't we don't have a daughter. So I said I don't have a sister. So. Holy moly! And then we asked around who, who who could have possibly called. Who would know who the doctor is and what his phone number is and why would they ask that? And that's never been solved. So. Dang. Oh. How many years after that was it? I don't know what to make of it, you know what I mean? So what year was that? Uh, That was probably, I would say, the year 2000. Oh, wow. Right right, right around that time. So um, your brother's brother's wedding, what what was the time frame between the wedding and the uh, the phone call? Uh, Geez, let's see. Um, It had to be at least a year, I think. Oh, wow. I'm thinking um, it could have been, I would, I'd have to remember, I don't remember, um, I would say at least a year, I think, somewhere about a year, you know, wasn't that, that long. or maybe, um, it could have been six months, maybe. Okay. Anyway, six months to a year, I would say. All right. So it wasn't that close, though. Hmm. Probably more like, I would guess, I would say a year. Yeah. At least. Now that I'm thinking about it, yeah. Wow. A year before. And then, so let's get to the actual, the, the phone calls. So you you, okay. you call Mike to just, what, just tell him that you're in town and I'm just trying to oh. get, 
get a picture of what, yeah. all, what all went down. Oh, so I called him, and he just, during the conversation, brought, brought up that I sounded like I had a cold the last time mm-hmm. when I called him. And that's what really set things off. <laughs> and then immediately he gets the... No. I mean, what, what made him say that? I mean... Yeah. You know, he could have easily just never brought that up. Yeah. Do you think if he... I mean, ha- something... Do you think if he yeah. hadn't have brought that up, that they would have intervened, or do you think they would just? Well, would... somehow it had to be. Um, unless the message would have been different, I don't know. But I, I think these things could put thoughts into your head. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yes, sir. But like, like, say this, or say, you know, I mean, it just seems too much of a coincidence because a lot of these times, when you hear stories about these men in black. People do stuff that they normally wouldn't do, like let strangers in their house. Yeah. Or something. So they have some control over over your behavior. I mean, <sighs> to a certain extent, at least anyway. Mm-hmm. Which is pretty pretty odd. Um, so I did um, <clears throat> get to talk to uh, Bud Hopkins about it. Mm-hmm. So he listened to the tape, you know. Yes, sir. And he said some of it, it seemed like, you know, some of it, of course, seemed like it was repeating itself. Uh-huh. And then other times it seemed interactive. Like it could easily be interactive and wanted to. Uh-huh. Like spontaneous. What, what what was his take on it? What did, what did he say? Oh, I, well, that was one of the things he mentioned. Uh-huh. You know, how it could be spun. Uh, yeah. And certain. And then, uh, you know, he, he, he was showing me pictures of, this other blonde guy with glasses, but the chin was much more tapered. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, you know, because the two people I described seemed very similar to some cases you had, but this blonde guy with the glasses, his, his chin didn't seem tapered, you know, like the, the, the picture, he, the drawing he showed me. Yeah. And, you know, then he actually, uh, yeah, it was something about, uh, a, a big bee on you, like if you were sleeping and something, uh, I don't remember, right? Would you be more intimidated with a giant bee or a bunch of bees? <laughs> and, well, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I don't know. I mean, yeah, so, I mean, it's still a mystery I can't solve. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. So about how long into the conversation with Mike before the 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 other call came in? Uh, I would say let's see. I'd say about ten seconds, maybe. Wow. Not more than ten seconds. So yeah, definitely a tapped phone situation. Yeah, I mean it was pretty damn quick. Mm-hmm. You know, I would say let's see, ten fifteen at most, probably even possibly less. Wow. Yeah, so, I mean, there's, there's no way that's coincidence. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, everything else added to it, you know? Yeah. All the surrounding uh, events. It's just um, kind of creepy, actually. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then you have John Keel having the same experience in the 60s. Yeah. I mean, good Lord, and then, um, when, you know, when they, I said, you know, that mentions to keep an eye on Orion. So I'm thinking, what the hell does Orion have to do with anything? Yeah. And then uh, this guy, Robert Bouval, comes out with a book called The Orion Connection, showing how the stars of Orion line up with the pyramids. An aerial view of the pyramids. Yeah. Another thing, too, I, I realized, you know how Whitley Strieber calls, calls the aliens the visitors? Say that one more time, sir. I'm sorry. Oh, Whitley Schreiber has called the, um, these aliens the visitors. Uh-huh. And extreme, uh, something extremely um, subtle is that in the, in the tape, these calls, they don't call them abductions or, or anything, you know, or anything like that. Mm-hmm. They just call them visitations. You know it's called visitation? Yes, sir, I do. So... It, to, to me, it seems like that from their point of view, uh, from their point of view, it's they can. I, I can see why now 
with cubicles and visitors, probably because that's how they introduce themselves or consider themselves or something to that effect. Yeah. I, I just find it odd that he uses that word and that and it comes up on this tape on the, in the phone call. Mm -hmm. And that's a real subtle um, key point that not too many people realize. Yeah, that is a, that's an excellent point. Yeah. A lot of weird things, you know. Um, apparently, uh, there's apparently bases on the moon, too. Yeah. Yeah, we've... Uh, We've not touched on the bases on the moon. Yeah, we haven't. We haven't spoke about it yet. But yeah, we we uh, we're aware that there's supposedly bases on the moon. And... Yeah, because a lot of I think some remote viewers um, picked up on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's kind of kind of interesting. Mm. I think there was another case too. I remember reading on the internet somewhere where. Um, some guy years later went to visit this uh, Mothman situation mm -hmm. in West Virginia. It's, it, the whole story's on the internet somewhere. And he started getting phone calls, too. But he had a, a sophisticated system to try to trace these calls. Mm -hmm. And, and you, the strangest freaking thing, when they traced, traced, tried to trace, I guess the best they could trace the origin, it showed up as coming from within the house. What? Really? Like somebody, yeah, like a like somebody was actually in the house accessing the phone lines. That's pretty freaking weird. Yeah. You know, I moved out. I forget who it was, and somewhere on the internet, um, I read the story where the guy revisited or reinvestigated the Walkman case, and then he started getting phone calls. Um, it's been years since I I read about that, so I'm not sure of the details who and when and where and stuff like that. Do you think it's possible that the, the the entity that called you was the same that called John Keel? You think it was Andrew Cole? Uh, I don't, either it's something, um, either something, well, I guess it's similar to the MIB, so I don't know. I mean, it's, is, it, is it a similar entity or the same one? I don't know. Mm-hmm. But they're using the same techniques, so it's pretty pretty amazing. That <laughs> yeah. when I read the book, I feel I was really really shocked. Okay, so the the call comes in, and just what what was going through your mind? Like, just were you like automatically freaked out, or just I know you thought it was maybe uh, Stephen, your brother, pranking oh, yeah. you. Yeah, because I, I didn't know what, to, you know, I mean, it just comes out on left field, you don't expect it. Mm -hmm. So I didn't, I mean, I was just more shocked and kind of, I don't know, you know, more surprised and shocked, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And. We just love the fact that your, you know, your parents got involved and got on the phone, and <laughs> that, that that those those yeah. parts crack us up. <laughs> <laughs> the next day, my uncle came over. Uh huh. Uh, my uncle, and um, you know, because him and my dad went to visit that uh, place in West Virginia, the uh, Green Bank. Uh huh. That's a whole other story, but uh, yeah. So my uncle came over, and uh, he's just, he's the one that said. I know, um, you know, he's the one that broke into the conversation mm -hmm. on that last phone call. Yeah, because yeah. he always used to go up on top of the firehouse in New York City and, and see all sorts of stuff going on. Oh, really? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Because my, my uncle, I mean, my uncle and my dad were in the New York City Fire Department. Mm -hmm. so, so, at least my, my uncle, yeah, he used to go up on the roof of the firehouse. You know, always be looking out for something. Yeah. So their their trip their trip to West Virginia was I mean what 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 was that sighting? Uh that was they went to look at the Green Bank Observatory when one of the um radio telescopes collapsed. Mm-hmm. 
and they were taking some video, and they were in separate cars. My uncle and my dad had two separate cars. And at one point, my dad sees, um, it kind of looked like a hat with a band around it. It's like a, basically a UFO type thing, mm -hmm. 20 feet across. I mean, 20 feet away. And it was kind of small, maybe the size of a VW. So maybe, I don't know, about 30 feet back. But really close and low. Mm -hmm. Like you could actually touch it. And then it blinked out. Like it didn't, it didn't fade away or, or look like it zipped with a blur. No, it just blinked out. Wow. But my uncle didn't, he didn't get to see that though, because he was in a different car, so on the road somewhere. And yeah, so. Yeah, so in fact, I remember John Keel um, saying one time that a lot of people who intensely study the subject mm -hmm. will end up interacting with it. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's great news for us. <laughs> oh man! I mean, you know, yeah, I mean, you never know. It seems to be a common uh, something that they've noticed. Uh huh. At least they noticed it. Yeah. I mean, not everybody, but. So, I mean, do you think the voice was trying to? Would you think it was kind of a warning? Do you? Th what What do you think was the meaning behind the calls? Uh, let's see. I, I think just to inform me of, I guess, what was happening. I, I don't know what else to make of it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's kind of, I mean, think of the oldest time that passed now and nothing, you know? Yeah. Just, yeah, the abruptness of it, just the fact that it was four phone calls and then nothing else yeah. is just so strange. It's. I mean, it's just freaking, uh, Kind of annoying. You think, I'd like to get some follow up. Uh, you know, if, if I'd seen a freaking MIB, I'd probably try to. You know, because I hear the stories how they just disappear around corners. Mm -hmm. I try to make sure it doesn't leave my sight and take all sorts of as many pictures and video as I could. Yeah. Especially now that everybody's got a cell phone. You know, I wonder what would. Uh, maybe they're not going to show up anymore because everybody's got cell phones. And, yeah, there's definitely. And, you know, yeah. These things really shy away from getting any kind of physical evidence. Uh -huh. You know, I, I think if you were out in the forest somewhere and like a Bigfoot or something was coming after you, uh, um, it would be more afraid of a live video feed with hundreds of people watching than it would be if you had like a 50 cal yeah. rifle. And I, I, I think it's, these things are more afraid of that kind of stuff it's just amazing. I mean, if anything scares them, it's it's like having as much proof as possible of their existence. Yeah. At least that's my take on it. That's very interesting. Yeah. Um. I, I, yeah, which makes sense. Otherwise, they would make themselves known. You know, and obviously they don't want to. Yeah. Now, to me, like, yeah. honestly, if I would have got those phone calls, I probably still would not be sleeping well. I mean, did you, were you scared? Was you concerned? I mean. Uh, I, it didn't really bother me. It was more of a, um, well, it did bother me a little bit. Um, but more of a mystery than anything. You know, I was kind of amazed, actually. I had the whole thing. It's, because it was just, you know, it was one event, a series of events like that. You know? mm -hmm. The helicopter or the people at the airport, and then that, you know? Yeah. It's more of like a shotgun type uh, <sighs> surprise type thing. Hmm. I mean, if, I guess it would be a lot worse if something just suddenly appeared in your room at night. Oh, <laughs> definitely. You know, like one of these freaking MIBs or some kind of stupid type sound person or something. Yeah. So you know what? When I was in Antonio, I, I you know what? It's another thing. When I was in San Antonio, mm -hmm. I don't know why I was always paranoid at night that something would come into the room at night. Mm -hmm. This could be a subconscious thing, and I didn't have an alarm, so I I, I kind of did something real tricky. I took one of these um, metal pans for like cooking cookies on or whatever the hell you pizza or something. Yeah. So I put that underneath the. In, into to the bedroom. Uh, to the, right, I put the metal pan underneath 
the door handle, and then I balance some coins on top of the handle so if somebody turns it, it would fall and make a crap load of noise oh, in wow. the metal pan. Oh, that is creative. Yeah. I don't know. But for a while, I was maybe maybe something happened. I don't remember, you know what I mean? I don't know why I was so so concerned about something coming in at night when I'm sleeping. Yeah. So, who knows? You know, I mean, they freaking erase your memory and stuff, so... So, um... Yeah, I mean, I'm, that might be something, too, but there. Uh, Have you tried to do any type of, like, maybe hypnosis or anything like that to try to see if there is any re uh, uh, repressed memories? No, I, I never really... never really tried it, yeah. Cause that, 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 I mean, that is... That's a good point. You never know. They may have... Yeah, I mean, there could be other crap that I don't even know about. Yeah. Yeah, that would be pretty interesting to find out. And it is. I mean, it's very strange, the fact that you never heard anything else after the four phone calls. I mean, especially since, you know, you've told your story. People are aware of yeah. it. You would think that there would be some sort of follow-up or some sort of worse warning. I mean, you recorded the voice you put it out there yeah yeah i know it's not like i didn't get any mib after that you know saying don't talk about it like some people do or nothing like that uh -huh. wow now do you yeah. do you think the mibs are a government or do you think it's beyond that no there's something they're definitely in, involved with this ufo subject yeah mm -hmm. they just made for simplicity's sake and they happen to make a movie out of because some people actually thought they were government agents because they, they pretended to be Air Force people and, or someone else. You know? uh -huh. that's, what, that's what started that theory. Yeah. But yeah, that, um, there's other ones where they, they probably pers on purpose appear um, extremely odd. You know? uh -huh. I think they do that crap on purpose. <laughs> that's not, I don't think it's a mistake, you know? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, they're doing it intentionally. I mean, if they want to look real weird, it, that's intentional because they want to. They want you to know this is. I'm not just some guy walking around. Yeah. Another human type thing. Yeah. Yeah. They want you to know that this is serious fucking business. Yeah, they want to know something. This, this is what's happening now is unusual, and um, but they don't want to appear so freaking out of place where, you know, someone calls the police on them either. Yeah. They got to. They got to go around fine line type of thing. Yeah. So, yeah, they're pretty, uh, pretty freaking, uh, sneaky in mm -hmm. that way. And God only knows what they're up to. It's probably not good. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt, I doubt it's good. Yeah, it's probably some kind of crap, you know. Probably, if we knew it, probably be pretty angry. Mm-hmm. So, what did the aftermath look like once the calls are done? I mean, you just returned to San Antonio? Did you tell, who did you tell? I mean, what was... Um, I, I just told some people I was friends with, you know. Uh-huh. And, um, yeah, that's about it, you know. And oh, and then, um, actually, my dad contacted Linda Howe, and, uh, she did, um, she did call out Bell and, and do an episode, I would say, probably about 15 minutes she talked about it. Yeah. On our Bell show. That yeah. Back, uh, I forget what year it was. So, Maybe like um, a year later or within six months or something. Yeah. Probably within six months, yeah. Now, was that, that was, uh, was it when he was still doing uh, Coast to Coast or was that the, was that uh, in yeah, the desert? Was, it was called uh, Dreamland. Midnight, Midnight in the Desert. With Linda Howe and, um, uh, when was that? Uh, yeah, it was, it was way to hell back when, you know, a long time ago. Mm-hmm. But that episode now is no longer available. Mm -hmm. They lost some of their um, files, even though I have a copy of it. But, really? Because I ordered it. Yeah, what it did is I, I I had to order an audio cassette tape of that program. I had to pay for it. You know? So I ordered the whole damn uh, program that night. You know, a cassette tape. Because I wanted a copy of it. I didn't get to hear it. When it, when it actually broadcast a lot I didn't get to hear it you know it's always late and stuff like that yeah what made you want to put it out there um well we didn't it was her idea to put it to go to our bell but uh, 
we called her to see what she what insight she can give us. Yeah. Okay, so you're basically just looking for answers and. Yeah, because she's like an expert on all this stuff. So, so she said after this aired, she got one phone call. Think how many radio stations tell her, right? Mm-hmm. She got one phone call from somebody in California who had a similar incident, but she didn't have a tape and she didn't elaborate any further. Really? So out of all the people that listened, there was only one person that, that to say they had a similar situation. Thanks for the phone call, anyway. Well, I mean, that that just doesn't mean, I mean, probably there's been several other incidents and the people are just too too frightened to say anything. Yeah, well, but it's pretty rare, though. This type of thing. Yeah. It's certainly in common, that's for sure. But according to the phone call, they're dealing with a lot of people. Yeah. You know, they said to visit the many, so, so they're dealing with a lot of people. Doing what? I have no idea. And I mean, I think... Uh, and then you know, they, they, they use the word visit, you know? Yeah. And that's another really important point, too. Keep an eye, yeah. keep an eye on the skies, near Orion. It's just, like, it's so cryptic in... Yeah, it's not like a normal conversation. No, like, know? just come out and say what you mean. Yeah. Yeah, because at first, I, I, when he said, how long are you going to be back from Texas? Mm-hmm. I didn't, I really, I wasn't clicking, you know? And yeah. then, how long are you going to be back in New York? But yeah, for some reason, I, I, it just threw me off. I don't know why it threw me off. Yeah. And then at some point, ask who you were. It's like, what? It's like, what the heck do you mean? You called me. You should know who I am. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm thinking maybe because I wasn't responding the way they thought I was, mm-hmm. or something. I think how can they not know my voice? They have to. Yeah. If they, yeah. That's the only thing I think of. If, I mean. I have a feeling they didn't expect me to react like that. How do you think they... Maybe that's why they asked, you know. How, how do you... What do you think they were wanting you to do? Just cow uh, in fear, or...? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what the hell would make of it. I mean, the question... Another question I would have is, why... I mean, why you, you know? Why were you targeted? Yeah, you know, um... I don't know. Nobody knows, you know? Yeah. Like certain people, that would be extremely uh, useful information to find out. That was from you, I mean. I'm sure there's there's a reason. We just don't know what the reason is. You know? Yeah. I mean, you were I you, I mean, you were in the Air Force, and I mean, your your father had a sighting, but it just seems so strange that they're targeting you specifically when it was your father that had the sighting, and it, I mean, you weren't even. Right, right. That's good. Yeah. I don't know, yeah, it's kind of weird. I just wish I had some answers. <laughs> yeah, I know, me too. <laughs> that would be freaking awesome. Yeah. I don't know what the hell's going on. And I wonder how much the government actually knows, and they're just not telling us, you know. Well, I mean, it's kind of ironic that just recently, the you know, the Pentagon is declassifying some things, saying that they, I mean, essentially admitting that aliens are real. and yeah. Definitely, yeah. I mean, uh, especially that new program, Unidentified, is excellent. Really yeah. Excellent. Yeah. I mean, they're coming out with a lot of credible witnesses and, and actual evidence, you know, like radar evidence. And yeah, those. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, those military the the military videos that they are they're releasing is just insane. It's, yeah, I mean, uh, multiple pilots seeing it. Now, come on, you can't just dismiss that. No, not at like all. Somebody said, you know, like that idiot, uh, what's that skeptic organization? Not, you know, unless some, an alien actually punched them in the face, they wouldn't believe it. Oh. They pretend not to believe in it. Yeah. But they actually do in, in, in private what they actually believe. Privately, probably is a different story. I forget, what was that uh, Skeptics Magazine? You know, you got all those uh, Shermer and, and the other guy that passed away, Phil Class. Yeah. Philip Class is an yeah, asshole. Yeah, he was a real character, that guy. Yeah, he was. <laughs> and I seen him once at, a, at a, one of these uh, conferences. Uh-huh. He's sitting at the deck sleeping, for Christ's sake. <laughs> and I think he actually, I can't remember if he had a tape recorder. It's like, you know, 
I mean, for someone who doesn't believe it, why would you show up for a conference? I mean, I don't believe in a flat earth, and, and that's why I wouldn't go to a flat earth conference. Yeah, no doubt. This guy is supposedly a skeptic, yet he shows up for one of these freaking conferences. <laughs> and he's not like a speaker or anything, so why show up? I, I don't know. He's just a weird guy. Yeah. And he was pretty nasty, too, when it came to debunking people. He would attack their... You know, he would always attack somebody's character. And... Yeah, I mean, you know... <laughs> he's, he's probably one of those insiders that mm-hmm. his job was to like squash any kind of information like this you know yeah well I mean it's, it's possible that you know that that was his job maybe the government was paying him to do some you know yeah counterintelligence and try to discredit everything and yeah help keep the lid on everything yeah, yeah. that's entirely possible yeah, I guess that's um, that's all I really got to add to it. Yeah, so you just you just can't buy into my talk boy theory, huh? You don't. <laughs> no, that's crazy. I mean, because I have to discount everything else. Yeah. I mean, someone would have to call within fifteen seconds, hire people to meet me at the airport, strangers. Yeah. Fly a helicopter around. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's fucking ridiculous. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, like... and then they would have to know. What... You know, they'd have to know that the aliens themselves consider them visits um, and a different wording, the, the sentencing structure. There's just so many other subtle things that yeah. they, people don't take into consideration. The fact that it happened to Whitley, I mean, um, John Keel, mm-hmm. it's extremely really similar situation. I mean, it's not like I was the first one. You know, yeah. I mean, it happened to him. None of this is considered when, when they bring up theories like that. Yeah, that's true. That's, a, that's an excellent point. And yeah. And it's just, it was very strange. It was something I meant to mention earlier. Earlier, it's so strange how the, the voice sounded like it was just losing steam. Like, it just felt like it was fading away at times. Yeah. I don't... Yeah, that, that is... Just, in fact, um, yeah, because some of the MITs, like Justin Danforth was talking about in his book, they say... Uh, some of these things say like they're losing energy and they have to leave. Yeah. Yeah, and one of the things we pointed out, we are talking about Justin Bamforth, um, you know, one of the things that I liked that really gives you, you know, a lot of credibility is the fact that you, you know, you haven't really, I mean, you've put it out there and you let people know about the situation, but you haven't been trying to, well, A, profit off of it if you could possibly, or, you know, you're not trying to no. be yeah. a celebrity, you know what I mean? No, because after, after the incident um, happened, you know, it was, it was on the Art Bell show, but that was because Linda Howell wanted to present it. Mm-hmm. And then after that, between then and the time Justin's book came out, I never brought it up again. Yeah. You know, because, um, uh, what's her name? Sue Switek from uh, New Farm Director from one of the states over there. Mm-hmm. I, I told I happened to tell her about it. She got interested and told Justin about it, Bamforth. And that's how it came out in the open again. Yeah. But before that, it's been buried. And, you know, I would know people. I mean, I could have friends that I know for 15 years or longer. It doesn't matter. And I, if they didn't believe in the subject, I would never bring it up. Yeah. Why bother? I mean, if somebody doesn't believe these things exist, I don't, I don't care how long I know them or how long. I'm not going to bring it up to them. Yeah. You know, and there's, so that's, that's how it's, it's been ever since. Just thank God that you had the for, the forethought to hit record. I mean, it'd be so hard to yeah. convince anyone. I know, yeah. I just got extremely lucky, basically. Yeah. Because, I mean, just imagine trying to tell people with zero proof. And right. it just, because it's such a crazy story. It's such a crazy case. And yeah, it's completely unbelievable. But you ha- you have the proof. Yeah, and 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 then you got John Keel and other people who had uh, kind of experiences like that. Mm-hmm. And just like you mentioned in the first episode, when Jack Safardi had weird things happen to him too. So. Yeah. Yeah, that was a very uh, interesting uh, interesting story too about him receiving those phone calls. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. 
I just want to say I truly appreciate you being on the show. And, uh, man, it's been a pleasure and an honor. Sure. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, thanks. Yes, sir. Well, you take care, okay? Okay. All right. Take care, then. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. What about that helicopter? That's crazy. That is absolutely insane. And then for him not to, you know, even discuss that until he, he's talking to us. I mean, yeah. that's just a, another. You yeah, know, I mean, that's he didn't even. That is brand new information that right. we, that nobody even knew. Yeah, and I, and and the funny thing is, I, I like how he stated that once the phone call happened, he starts kind of going back in his memory. Yeah. And, he, and it starts falling, well, you saw the helicopter. Then, you know, I should have went out there and asked that guy, but how did he not see it? It was a damn helicopter 20 feet off the ground. Yeah. So I'm not going to ask him. And then, you know, with him saying that he contacted the uh, the landlord to, you know, keep an eye on his thing. And I thought it was very interesting that he stated that he had put a sweater on over his uh, name tag. Name tag. Yeah. That was, I wonder now what would have happened if he hadn't. You know, would would things have gotten even stranger, or would would they have tried to just sit next to him on the plane, follow him? At least he had the forethought not to tell him his name. Yeah, man, it's just so. God, it's just so crazy, and I mean, he's right. He's just like he would. He has no answers. Like it's been decades. Yeah, and he still he has still no. Still has no answer. Yeah, and and I. The whole thing with that episode of the Art Bell show, you know, it's not in the art. Well, I guess it is in their archives, but, you know, it's not on the Internet. And then the fact that they got Linda Moulton Howe to discuss this, you know, it just proves. I think it proves his credibility. Yeah. Man. Thank I mean, just thank God he hit record because he's right. I mean, if that happened now. Nobody. How would you do? I was. I don't even know how you would record it now. Uh, Yeah, I don't either. Unless you go to voice memos, but I'm not even sure you could do it then. No. Would you have the forethought? It would take so long to get it. You know. And then another thing is, are you going to answer it on a cell phone now with all the spam risk that block these calls and and things like that? I mean, I hope that was a good interview. I was kind of fanboying it. You know. No, you did a great job, man. I was a. Just crazy, like it is to us. That guy's a celebrity because, like, like I said in the 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 best episode. That's that's my favorite case because of the the audio. It's just so crazy. Well, I think it's it it's one of my favorite cases as well, just because of it poses so many questions that no one can answer. Yeah, I mean, it's perfect for like it's one hundred percent perfect for this podcast. It's Cases like that are the reason why we wanted to do this. But, yeah, I mean, the fact that he put it out there, that we were discussing it, we're interviewing him about it, and there's never been any other contact. You would think that they would want him to be silent about it. Right. You would think why, a lot of the MIB stories are, yeah. you know, you're talking too much. Yeah. Why would why would they allow that? It's just It's just so crazy. I hope we don't. God, I, when he said that, I was like, <laughs> yeah. I've got to drive home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he's like, people that study it get uh, get to be involved in it. No, 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 I may have to figure out how to press record if you haven't experienced it like two in the morning. Dude, like, a- what? Hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> so, well, ladies and gentlemen, that was our interview with Gary Sudbrink. If you haven't, we probably should have said this before we interviewed him, but if you haven't listened to the episode, it is episode three. Please forgive the audio. We've got better equipment now, but man, it was a case that we had to cover. It was one of the, when I made my list of cases, it was definitely right up at the tippy top. So, Well, and for our first couple of episodes, I will have to say, somehow we got all the dials turned the right way, and it was one of our better first episodes. Yeah. I th- yeah, we... So, when when people meet me, and when people see me in person, my friends, and they find out I have this podcast, 
they always ask, what's an episode I need to listen to? And I always say, I say, forgive the audio, but listen to episode three. It's freaking crazy. I just, oh, man. So, let's, well, I mean, we got. We, we don't have theories because we, we, we've already <laughs> discussed all that. I, I like the fact, though, that he was, he wasn't belligerent about the talk, but he just, you know, that's not, you, I've been listening to a lot of, like, podcasts where they discuss, uh, they go in depth about linguistics and how people talk about real things and things like that. You could tell that this is a true story. He's not making it up, making it up because when we brought up the talk boy, he, no, it just didn't happen. And that's a, that's a genuine reaction to something that a person feels is completely false. They're just going to, no, I'm not even going to entertain that because I lived it. You don't know what I went through. Uh-huh. That's not possible. Yeah. And it, and I think also we didn't ask him because he kind of hinted around, or not really hinted around, but he kind of danced around the fact that, no, the talk boy is not going to be, that's not a plausible answer to this whole thing. Also, by saying that, he doesn't entertain the theory that this was a friend that was trying to prank him either. Yeah. And I also like the fact that he's he keeps it close to the vest, as he said right there at the end of the interview. You know, if when I meet people, you know, I, it's not one of my party tricks to, oh yeah, I got this phone call. And he yeah. said within you know a couple of minutes, I'll know whether or not I'm going to bring that up. Yeah. I mean, look, I know that my talk boy theory was shit when I said it the first time. But as but I had to say, I was going to say as a podcast, we have to bring up the have, other side. I. One thousand percent believe Gary. One thousand percent believe him. I do not think it's a hoax. No, I don't either. I don't think he. I don't think he was hoaxed unknowingly. I don't think he hoaxed it. I think this was a true experience. I think after his experience, he, like most everyone, tried to find answers, and then he got, like he said, he read the book. He realized John Keel had an epi- you know, an, an example of the same thing. You know, and he, he's just a man trying to find answers like any of us out there that if we got a strange phone call, we're going to try to find a plausible answer to it. Yeah. We don't have uh, our theories on this case just because we've already discussed my, that. My theory is the man had an MIB experience, but for what purpose, I don't know. I can't tell you. And I wonder, we didn't get a chance to ask him, and it's been so long. I wonder if... Uh, Hopefully he listens to this episode and maybe he can reach back out to us. But I wonder if he, if he thought back, did he work on something when he was in the military? Did he happen to, someone thought he saw something, but he really didn't, and so they're checking up on him? Those kind of questions. Yeah. But again, you know, I, I'm with you. I think he is 1,000% truthful, credible, and this was a real experience. So, recommendations? I recommend episode three, Mysterious Bruce. Well, I'm going to uh, go away from that, and I'm (laughs) going to recommend another podcast. And if you are a true crime fanatic, you like the ins and outs of that genre, the criminal profiling, um, if you have not heard of them, which I was, and they have over 240 episodes. <laughs> but it is called Real Crime Profile. It is a podcast that Jim Clemente, former FBI profiler, uh, Laura Richards, she is a criminal behavior analyst and former New Scotland Yard officer. And Miss Lisa Zambetti, she is the casting director for CBS Criminal Minds. Uh oh. They do episodes, and their first. Four episodes is they dissect Making a Murderer, the Stephen Avery case. And then the second case that they tackle, and I have not listened to it yet, and I'm dying to just because of the ins and outs that they find, the little minute details, they actually go over the O.J. Simpson case. Really? They do some high-profile cases. He did it. Oh, no shit. (laughs) Uh, Just looking through their... um, there are other episodes they they actually go 
and meet with the arresting officer, James Fitzgerald, in the Unabomber case. Wow. They go over the Orlando mass shooting. They go over Oscar Pistorius. You know, if there's a high-profile case out there, look through their episodes. They have a lot of good cases. And they, in the Making a Murder, I'm sorry, Making a Murderer episodes, they kind of, you know, disagree on some points, but they objectively put their theories out there. So, again, I'm kind of rambling, but if you're into true crime and you have not heard of Real Crime Profile, look them up as a podcast. I guarantee you will not be disappointed. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, Coach, you got anything else? Man, I'm just... I'm just... Over He's got a glow about him. Yeah, I'm, just over, I'm over the moon, man. I can't believe that we actually got him to do an interview. I, this That's just phenomenal. I'm just so happy. High point after, I mean, for this to be episode 51, hey, I think we did all right. Yeah, man. I mean, this, I'm just so happy that we decided to do this. Just the things that have happened because we decided to to start a podcast of stuff that we would sit around and talk about just me and you shooting the shit and you kept saying it forever like this we should do a podcast we do find like yeah whatever we ain't gonna do no podcast then you just call me and you're like hey man i bought equipment and i'm like well, f- shit i think we're gonna do a podcast <laughs> <laughs> so yeah um and thank just, you to all of our patrons thank you to all of our fans on our social media thank you to our wives for allowing us to do this and those of you that don't get on social media but listen to us and downloads, thank you, thank you, thank you. We are on Podbean now. I think they finally allowed our feed to be in there. We don't have a whole lot of advertising on Podbean, but if you are a Podbean subscriber to other podcasts, look us up on there, and that will help us out a lot. So with that, 